fighting right. How you doing? Happy Friday. Yes. Memorial Day weekend. What are we doing here, kids? Welcome, welcome. some photos of my guest today. Yes, hey, look at me. Yes, Miss Efren Asheree is in the house today. Yes. <laughs> on this rainy Friday. Come on, people. Hey, Smash. How you guys feeling? Welcome. Welcome into my living room. <laughs> Let me throw some more photos up of this glorious woman. Yes, come on, yes. Good, feeling peace. Oh, that makes me feel good. Hey, Peter McMath. Peter, I need to get you on, baby. Welcome into the room, yes. Happy Friday, happy Friday. Thank you for being here. This is my lovely guest. Oh, I'm doing good. Today was a today was a powerful week, and thank you for asking. It was good. It was really good. Yes, Peter. This is my guest, guys. Today's guest, Efren Bounce. Yes, look at these photos. Just gorgeous. Welcome. Let me turn my grooves down, even though I want to keep dancing. Hey, Jeremy, I heard you're moving. Is that true? <laughs> Are you moving out of New York? Oh, yes. Hey, Chris Davis, all the kids are here. Yes, well, welcome, welcome, welcome to my Danny G Live. It's Friday, it's Memorial Day weekend. The weather is whatever, we're alive, okay? So we will make peace and love and fun however we can this weekend, but just stay strong and I hope you guys had a great week. This was a great week, you know, moving into June and summer stage is gonna be announced on June 3rd. I've got my I Love New York t-shirt on because the energy in these streets is unreal and I'm just so thankful and feeling blessed to be in this moment with my adopted city. I've been here now living up in Washington Heights for 20 years? Oh my God, 20 years. I think it's 20 years. But, you know, the energy is feeling really good. And I'm feeling really positive and happy. And, you know, prayers going out to, you know, still India and all these other regions that are still suffering terribly from this awful pandemic. And don't, don't get it twisted, folks. We're still in it. So stay safe. Keep wearing your masks where you need to, you know, do what you feel to stay safe and what you need to stay safe. But just take care of yourselves because we really are still in it and we do not want this to tick back up for this city. Let me sit back. Oh, come on, look at this glorious diva. So to my guest, Efrat Bounce Asheree, I think she sent me a request to join, but I'm going to get you right in, Efrat. But I always have to do the intro for these glorious guests that I have. So Efrat Asheree is a New York City-based girl, B-girl dancer and choreographer and a 2016 Bessie Award winner for Innovative Achievement in Dance. Yes. Fred has received numerous awards to support her work, including Dance Magazine's inaugural Harkness Promise Award, the Jacobs Pillow Fellowship at the Tillis Center for the Performing Arts at LIU, and a Jerome Foundation Travel and Study Grant. Efrat is a regular guest artist with Duran Stans, which I got to see her at the Joys for their Christ her Christmas show, um, and has worked and collaborated with Doug Elkins, Rainey Harris, Bill Irwin. Bill Irwin, come on. David Parsons, Gus Solomon's legend, and Buddha Stretch, yes, <laughs> among others. Oh, thank you, girl. I got you. She earned her BA from Barnard College, Columbia University in Italian, which I want to find out about, and her MFA from the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, where she re researched the vernacular jazz dance roots of contemporary street and club dance. So she did her homework, kids. Okay. Uh, Efren has been on faculty at Wesleyan University, has set pieces for students at Smith's College, SUNY Brockport, Alvin Ailey Dance Center, University of Texas Rio Grande, 
Old Dominion University and teaches at Broadway Dance Center. She is a co-founding member of the all-female house dance collective Mawu, who I've presented, which is crazy, and is a forever grateful to New York City's underground dance community for inspiring her to pursue a life as an artist. Come on, Efrat! So let me go grab her because I am so excited to talk to this lovely, fabulous young woman who's going to be calling in from, I believe, her bubble. <laughs> yes. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Technology. You never know. Hey, oh, she <laughs> was under my setup right. Hang on. Hi. Come on, muscles. Come yes, on, I'm muscles. I'm in the theater. Muscles in the screen. I love Wait, it. Wait, hold on. It's too much. I'm on the floor of the theater. We love Are it. You okay? oh Are you okay God. with I'm this? Are you back? Okay. <laughs> Come on, Muscles. You look gorgeous. What Thanks. is going on? How are you? I'm so happy to be here. I am so excited to talk to you today because most of my guests, as you know, have been people that I've like worked with, grown up with, all of the above. So getting a chance to actually get to know you better in this way is so exciting for me. <laughs> I'm a little nervous, but it's exciting. Oh my God. Well, I'm nervous too, but I feel like we're so connected because we, we have so many points of intersection. We just haven't really had like a chunk of time to really, Absolutely. you know, do First this. All, I'm just like gas out over your arms because <laughs> that's my whole journey. And I'm like, come on arms. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't. I'm like not. You know, my social media game is not on point. So I'm not even used to doing this. So I didn't know it was just gonna give me like torso. So no, sorry. you're perfect. It's perfect. <laughs> Trust me. It's, it's, I've had all kinds of issues with folks coming in all crazy, but this is perfect because I'm so glad you're in the studio because it's really giving people a sneak peek into mm -hmm. what this life is, right? Yeah, and we're so in the theater actually rehearsing here. Yes. So yeah. This is awesome. I just yeah. have so much to come to arms. Yes. So, <laughs> please tell us, first of all, how you're doing, and then tell us where you are and what you're doing. Sure. I mean, I'm doing well, knock on wood. I always got to say that. I don't know. As dancers, you know, our bodies, I feel, are the most humbling thing, right? Like, they're always changing. A little injury grows or shrinks. One day, you get up feeling great. Another day, you're like, oh, what's happening? So I don't know, just I'm very grateful that I'm feeling good and healthy. You know what I mean? Especially in, in this very trying time and perilous time for so many people. Mm -hmm. So that is for sure. I'm so happy to be here. And yeah, so we are at uh, Bridge Street Dance Theater, which is up in the Catskills. Mm -hmm. And um, it is a bubble residency made possible by possible by works in process at the Guggenheim, yes. um, which is a real blessing because we get to be here, you know, sans masks like rehearsing we were double tested that whole thing you know and um uh, you know some people are vaccinated some, whatever like it doesn't matter like we we were actually really um fortunate that we had one bubble residency residency in september with works in process and this is our second one because they've been so supportive of the fact that we were supposed to premiere a new work called underscored in october 2020 but of course it didn't happen because mm. of the pandemic and they have followed through and supported us despite everything that was going on with these two bubble residencies and it's like just the biggest blessing so yeah. we are getting ready for a show on june 2nd in the rotunda and like what a blessing and so shout out to duke dang yes right? big time big, big shout time. out to duke dang who i just met for the first time mm. Like this year, I went to see, um, oh, I forget the name, the name of the company right now, but they also performed at the Guggenheim in the Rotunda, which where, is where you'll be June 2nd, two shows, Two right? shows, yeah, 6.30 and 8.30. Exactly, and the tickets, I believe, they don't release them until 72 hours before. Exactly, yep, right? and they are giving, I, if I understand correctly, like free tickets to essential workers, which I think is pretty amazing, so yeah, get at your essential so worker so people. people and really what it takes to perform these days, especially dancers who are so intimately connected physically, what it really takes to, to do all the testing, um, quarantine, like what did it take for you guys to come to this bubble? And, and also just tell us what a bubble is for those that don't understand what that means. Yeah, and so I, I should say that it's been interesting to see how the protocol has shifted, right? From like September where no vaccinations were possible really, you know, they weren't really available to now. So then we had to actually quarantine, I think for, uh, maybe it was 10 days then, I think. Yeah, seven or 10 days and then do the double testing, right? Mm -hmm. So like, Three days into the quarantine, we tested. And then the morning that we got on the bus, we tested. And now 
um, the protocol was for anyone that was vaccinated, they didn't have to quarantine, but they still had to test the morning of the bus. And if you're not vaccinated, you have to just do the same quarantine, se seven days in the double testing. Then we're also tested while we're in the bubble. So like, it was kind of amazing. We were at the top of the day. We just started warm up and a woman, a really lovely woman just from the pharmacy was like, all right, let's do a little, ding, a little twirl. That's it. We were calling her like, you ready to twirl? <laughs> this is like a <laughs> And then we went, it's just, that's what it is. But, um, wow. but, but that's really nothing, you know, in, in respect to like how amazing it is to be able to dance together, just like without masks, because that is hard to do. I mean, it's so possible. You did the first, sorry, we did the first bubble. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How, how, how many months had it been since you had come together with your dancers? Well, yeah. I'm, okay. So that was. I think we had our last show March, like beginning of March at University of Maryland, and then everything was canceled. I'm sure you talked to all these, you know, all these artists. It was like, you would just, you, there was a certain period of time where you got like seven different cancellation emails every day Ugh. from just like tour, you know, tour gigs getting canceled, but also then like space cancellation and residents, like everything. So, wow, that was, so from March to September, we hadn't really, you know, been able to rehearse together. We did a little bit of dancing in the park, and then we also did, we stayed pretty, pretty much in contact on Zoom regularly. Like, I felt like I wanted to, I don't know, we all had different levels of the blues, you know, so it was helpful for us to stay connected, even if some days we just talked, other days we danced, you know, other days we, like, exchange resources or music or whatever. It did help us, I think. So when we got to the residency, we were like really on the same page. However, I will say that we all had different growing pains in the residency. Like, mm, tell me about that. that. Like it was, a, I mean, it was amazing. Like it was a gift, but I think everybody started to understand. Like, I think, you know, I feel like as artists, you're used to kind of figuring things out and making things work. And especially as like, you know, anyone that's in, you know, street dance or social dance, like especially hip hop, you always hear that um, that saying, it's like making something out of nothing is kind of the vibe with like a lot of these community events, right? Um, you just make it happen, right? And you're kind of about that as you're training and everything and just in the community. Oh my goodness, wait, I have a visitor. Miko, come here. Yes! This is Jimbo, our lovely, oh wait, come here, Miko. <laughs> He's the best dog ever. Wait, Miko, come on. Come on, please. I love no, him. He's... <laughs> okay. He's the calmest most wonderful dog he looks like an arctic fox should i just turn so you can see him yes you see him yeah. oh, wait do you see him though or am i not wait miko. oh miko come oh, here yes, I do. oh so cute he's, yeah jimbo bye, brought miko. her dog okay bye miko he's the loveliest in the morning he'll That's just so come down great. when i'm warming up he's great we love him. he gives me notes it's so good <laughs> <laughs> um no but i think it was just kind of like you did what you had to do to get through it and then when you were finally back into a place where you're like, oh, this is family, I can breathe, you started to realize all the weird things that you had had to do to mm -hmm. be okay. You know what I mean? So like, I mean, some people were like questioning their lives. Like, can I still dance? Like, am I still a dancer? Oh. You know, and other people were like, I haven't been around people in so long. Like, I have to control everything. Like, let me chill, what am I doing, right? And then for yeah. me, it was like, wait. I mean, it was kind of, <laughs> I had this feeling that I might never get a chance to choreograph again. Like I didn't oh. know if we be, would be able to be together again. So I was like, guys, I have to try every single idea I've ever wanted to for this piece. And it's gonna make you crazy. And I'm gonna jump around. And you know, they're so wonderful. And they really were patient with me. Cause I would just be like, okay, let's try this thing right quick. And then this other thing. And then this other thing, because I didn't know when the next time we would be able to be together. And I wanted to have an idea in my head of like what's worthwhile sort of investigating more in terms of ideas versus you know, saying like, okay, this is one idea. Let's spend like these four days just focusing mm -hmm. on that. Like, no, it was like, let's spend this hour with this thought I had and this part of the music and see if it goes anywhere, you right. know? And so, cause it was sort of like, I know I said this a lot, but it, it wasn't even like, let's recharge the battery. Mm. It was like, is there a battery? That's how I felt, you right. know? So, right. but then of course, once it's going, you're like, ah, yeah. you know, it feels so Justin Johnson, is Johnson on there just that you're a powerhouse. Oh, wait, is that Justin? <laughs> oh, Justin, what's up? So, yeah, that's, I mean, going back to things shutting down, I think yeah. um, one of the last few shows that I saw was actually Michelle Dorrance's, I can't remember the name they call it, but her Christmas show. Her yeah, the Nutcracker. Nutcracker. I saw yeah. you, her, and the Nutcracker. Yeah, yeah. And then after that, I got to see Complexions at the Joyce, mm -hmm. and then everything shut down. And 
you know, yeah, it was really hard for me as a presenter to have to make those calls and those yeah. emails. So on this side of it, you know, really feeling quite shitty having to say, sorry, like, I know you know it's a pandemic, but I have to cancel your show. Yeah. And that's like 15 different phone calls I had to make. And that was the absolute worst feeling. And I don't, I mean, absolutely, the artists took the biggest brunt of this, right? But, you know, even talking to my fellow presenters, I started my presenters group last summer, just so we could talk amongst ourselves and how we felt about all of this. Yeah. It was really, it was really terrible, but. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's the whole ecosystem, right? So it is hard for you. Like, I received that. That is, that is shitty. <laughs> you yeah, know? it's sure to go on. And especially someone like myself who's dancing and been an artist, I know what it feels like to get yeah. something canceled. And it's like, you know, get your money and all these things. So it's just really like a horrible. I'm just glad we're slowly coming out of it. And I'm so encouraged and inspired. And I'm just feeling the energy. And so... One of the questions I did want to ask you is yeah. the nickname Bounce. Uh, I see Felix. What's up, Felix? Uh. <laughs> yeah, so tell me about your nickname, Bounce. Yeah, so um, I got so lucky to meet Break Easy, right? Richard San Santiago, a.k.a. Break Easy. He was my, my breaking mentor, like, I, I got lucky that my friend Nicole, who um, she's still my dear friend, and she's an amazing hairstylist. Anyways, I met her, and she... Um, I had seen, okay, I had seen Roman Jewels. Rennie Harris says Roman Jewels, right? I was about that, yeah. And that changed my life. Like, I was already a hip-hop head growing up, but I hadn't ever seen a woman breaking live in front of me until I saw that show. And yeah. then I was like, what have I been doing all my life? I need to do that. <laughs> that was super inspiring for me. And then when I got back to the city, because I had seen it at, uh, at ADF, actually, mm -hmm. And I was looking for practices and I met Nicole and she was like, Oh, you want to go to this breaking practice? I practice in Bushwick with break easy. And I was like, but mm -hmm. she took me to the practice and it was like a really, you know, community center, Bushwick Highland community center, free open to the everybody. Um, and he was there. And of course, slowly I discovered he's like this OG B boy from the seventies. He has a crew called breaking in style. And he just mm -hmm. held these free community practices. And after, you know, after you show sort of commitment over many months, right. Then um, I think, Especially for women, I think it was, especially in that moment, there weren't that many B-girls. It was like, okay, are you here? Why are you here? Are you here to get a, are you a fan? Are you, are you trying to get a boyfriend? Like once they, you know, people saw that you're serious and they start so, showing you things and Break Easy was just so generous with his time and showing me things and everybody there really like, um, and he gave me the name. So he gave me the name Bounce because of my top rocks. Got a little pep. <laughs> A little pep on the step. That's what he said. I remember we were at the park because in the summer we would practice at McCarran Park and I was just like, wow. nice. He's like, yeah, it's bounce, it's bounce. I'm like, what? He's like, yeah, you're bounce. I was like, okay. And, and then, it's just stuck. Yeah, oh, so I he like that. knighted me in a way. <laughs> That's how actually, I feel. Actually, so I don't know if you saw, but uh, Rennie Harris is restaging Roman Jewels. Um, I believe oh, yeah. that. Yes, I did see and that. I'm actually going to have him on next Friday <laughs> to talk about. I know. So yeah, he so for me, what was so colossal in my life was that was a show that inspired me. And then I got to dance in that show years later, right? Like no I got way. Yeah, I mean I got to I danced with Rennie, like, you know, for a period of time. And that was I remember so clearly, like I came off stage, I was so moved by like the fact that I was doing the show that had inspired me and with all these incredible dancers, you know? And oh, I remember awesome. like I was like tearing up after I got off stage. And there was this b-boy abstract, I mean, super ill, was like, are you you're right? And I was like, no, 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 I'm good. <laughs> he thought I was injured, but I was just having a moment. It was like a full circle moment for me. That's and, so incredible. Yeah, Rennie has been so supportive. And um, we got to perform in Philly in February before this happened. Oh. And he came to the show. And that was... Where did like, you perform? Uh, at the Annenberg. Nice. Yeah. So it was, yeah. and I got to see JB too. So JB, Aunt Jo. Yeah, so they, I invited JB, but then they were just, Philodenko was just coming back from tour, but she was like, come and have a coffee with me. So the morning I left, I went and had a coffee with JB. Um, oh, Philly for me is so special. I just, yeah. Philly peeps, like so many incredible dancers, Danita and Kyle and Mel and, and just ruckus and metal oh, and so okay. many that's, amazing that's scenes. That's my hometown, so absolutely. Oh. And yeah. I've known Rennie since, uh, Oh wait, Monique Martin's in there. Monique, <laughs> hi, I'm hugging She's you. She's so great, that's my girl. I've known Rennie since, um, gosh, I was like 13 or 14 and 
they used to have a rehearsal studio somewhere near South Street, and I would just kind of like wander over and mm. kind of peek in and see what was going on. So I, I'm so just ex happy for the relationship he and I have to this day. And yeah. he's such a special person. He's so, yeah, so special. I've like learned so much from him and he is so supportive and yeah. so open to like a phone call anytime. And anytime. Yeah. And so I do want to go back to, since, again, I don't know you all that well, but just even fascinated reading your bio and born in Israel, mm -hmm. but then live, like, what, what age did you leave Israel to go to Italy? Yeah, super young. I was 10 months old. So um, <laughs> <laughs> moved to Italy till I was seven and then came here. Mm -hmm. So my Hebrew is very terrible, but my <laughs> Italian is very good. <laughs> And when did when did you come to to New York? Um, so right from Italy, we lived in Westchester, and then came. I came to the city for school when I was eighteen, and have been here ever since. So it's only been like five years. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I know I do that all the time too. Like when people say to me, "You were in Italy what year?" I was like, "Yeah, I was two. Yeah. And, exactly. um, well, so I know you in your in your bio it said that you studied. Your mom took you to ballet class first, and yeah, you know. So how? What was it about, you know, social dance, street dance, hip hop that sort of like stole you away from the ballets? Yeah. I mean, so it's interesting, like, you know, I came to the U.S. when I was seven, right? And I think I had no sense of what it meant to be American. I didn't understand, you know, and I'm a little kid. And so I just knew that I liked what I liked, which was I listened to the radio and I was listening to Ha 97 all the time. <laughs> <laughs> like as a kid it was weird like I remember once I maybe was nine or ten and we were going to visit my family my grandparents were still alive at the time we were going to visit them in Israel during a summer and I like cried to my mom and I was like just leave me here oh. I'm gonna miss all the songs and I'm not gonna be able to make the mixtapes yeah because there was no streaming of music like there's no you know I remember that's how much like I I read like I coveted the mixtapes that I made and I traded them with my friends. You know, like it was a thing. I was just into hip hop. It was my way of understanding. Yeah. Sort of, you know, I don't know. It was just what I was into that it was no one else in my family knew anything about it, you know, of course. Mm -hmm. um, and of course afterwards, once I got into the, into breaking and then into the underground scene in house, then it was just like, okay, this is yes. the whole world and under, understanding more deeply all the cultural reflected reflective styles everything breaking hip-hop house you know what i mean and the deep history and all of that yeah um, so and tell me about your entry point into that because you know mm -hmm. reading all your story you know going to club shelter and timmy richardsford and Eight friday all these people i'm like <laughs> you must have been going in there underage well i'm not going to tell you how old i am <clears throat> but um <laughs> <laughs> well but, i'm going to tell you like I, i'm 52 Ooh, i forgot so good <laughs> Oh my god. I was going to the Paradise Garage since I'm like 14. You went to the garage? <laughs> Wait, you went to the garage? Yes. So you know this project that I'm working on right now, Underscored, is like about those seminal parties, the garage. I know. That's what I was and talking about it. Just before I got on, Michelle Saunders, who is 78 years young and was at the garage killing it, and Archie Burnett, legendary Archie Burnett, 62 years young, they're here with us at the residency, and they are showing us how it's done, basically, every single day. I'm, and I'm so excited. I'm definitely coming, and so I really wanted to talk to you about that, because I remember going to the Paradise Garage, and I was still living in Philly. I was 14, mm. 15 years old, and because it stayed open literally until noon the next day, yeah. we would go to rehearsal at Philadelphia. And we would get in, we would like go somewhere and eat, and then we would get on the road after midnight, like two in the morning. Club head. I don't know where my mother thought I was, but <laughs> I was going up to Paradise Garage. And we would get there at like two or three in the morning, dance until dawn or nine or ten, wake up, go outside in sunlight, get a little coffee, a little breakfast, and then drive back to Philly. I mean, come on. No, but that's way so I never got to go to the garage right I'm just hearing all these stories and like you know I'll go to the reunion and stuff but I know that there's nothing like the garage like everybody I talk to says this is just like you know Everything. impossible to replicate but I do know that the parties that I was really for fortunate enough to intersect with when I first started going out were part of that lineage of dances mm -hmm. you know so like Larry LeVan David Mancuso right that lineage of yes. the way to party and the way to be 
inclusive and the way the vibe builds and builds and builds and it's this like very sacred space so that's what shelter was shelter for me was like my paradise garage right yeah. it was the party that i went to every saturday night that i would get to you know once i started to understand what was up you get there at four or five in the morning and then you stay till noon or you stay till yeah two. and there was a moment when i would i mean this is like I don't remember exactly when, but I would go and I would like, I would dance from like six to maybe 10 or five to 10, 5 a.m. to 10 a.m. And then I would go teach a breaking class at like 1030 to noon. And then I would come back and catch the last two hours, which were always really good. It was a little more empty. You could do more stuff. Anyway, so that's cool. I didn't know you were at the garage, Danny. Girl, listen. And you know, the garage too was a members only club, right? Yeah. And so here I was 15, 16, and my friends were older because they, they could drive and drink and all these things. And they were pushing me up to the line and with my cute young self and trying to get somebody's membership card to let us in. Yes. So, no, that's, that's actually one of the stories that we've talked a lot about, like how you could get your membership card revoked if they caught you trying to get strangers in. But, but if you were so fly, no one is, no one is caring. Like, so I'm here from Philly. Can you let me in? And then the person will be like, all right, sure, babe. And then I'll be like, come on, guys. <laughs> Where are all these other people? <laughs> oh, you know, I want to like, hear your stories. Like, was just everyone talks about the sound system there, that Richard Long oh, sound system being the best. There was nothing like walking up into the Paradise Garage and that thumping and that, that oh my God, that. So, beat. okay. Oh, it was everything. That's literally, no, that's like one of Archie's sections. He like has this moment where he's like talking about the ramp and the throbbing. The ramp. Because like, and you know, I felt uh, completely safe because usually once we got in there, you know, we get separated. And it was dark and you know, nobody was trying anything. Like every single time I came out unscathed and that those are times you could go and do that. No one was trying to slip something in your drink. No one was trying to pull you in the corner and you know what I mean? It, this was a good time. Everyone yeah. Dance. Oh, Craig Smith. He said, oh, hey, Craig. Oh, my gosh. Hi. What? He was dancing with my babies. I want to pop in what? and say hi. Um. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, the Paradise Garage was a good time. Powder on the floor. Everything you think of when you think about house clubs. Yeah. It, it was it. And, yeah, I know, it was a great part of my life. That's, so how many years were you going? Like, I mean, so 15 was, I guess, like 1983, four. And I went all through my teens. Like, people go up until, I guess, close or maybe until I was 18, 19. Yeah. I don't know. So, yeah. Close, but close in 87. So, yeah. yeah. After that, you know, the Palladium opened. Yeah. And that was a cool vibe, but it just wasn't the same. I mean, and that's what everybody says that was at the garage. It's like, ah. Shelter came close. Shelter came yeah. close. But yeah, Palladium was more, mm, it wasn't too much, a house, hey, hey, hey. but yeah, definitely. Uh, uh, so the shelter, and not to make this a sad moment, but can we just give a little love and shine to Voodoo Ray? Oh. Yeah, I mean, he's, everybody I mean, knows Voodoo he, Ray. He like, big brother, everything, uncle, every, like to my, to Mau, to my crew, he was so supportive, like, he would make, first of all, he would make us laugh. He would say our name wrong, like 75,000 times and make us laugh so much on the mic. And um, he was the one who made us laugh the most. And he was always a champion for like, for women coming up really to like find ways for us to do shows and just support us. And I don't know, he was like, a, he was a gatekeeper. You know, I think we, we feel, feel the profound loss of Ray in the community and of Marge to Marjorie Smart, like yeah. his sister to me too. And so many other dancers of my generation and like yeah I mean it's irreplaceable like yeah. I don't know what to say other than like we miss them every day like it's not yeah. I remember even for a while after he passed and this happened with March too but with Ray I was going out more right after like I was around and mm -hmm. I kept thinking I would see him like and this happened to a lot of people because mm -hmm. his energy was so huge you know and you're so used to like seeing him dancing or seeing him joking around or seeing him on the mic and that was his presence right and it was just so yeah they just made a really beautiful mural of of him at uh, at cielo so if you oh, guys nice. want to check that out yeah check that out and then i didn't meet ray until after actually i stopped dancing 
because while I was dancing professionally with Ailey, I just, you know, I was so tunnel vision. I was like, I'm doing this thing. And once tour was over, I was back in Philly. I didn't meet Ray until I came back to New York. I moved here permanently in 98, 99. And I started going out to the clubs. I started my band. And then I started seeing this person. He was like, I know you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but he knew me before I knew him, really. But hey, Ian Friday, we just said your name, oh, brother. Ian Friday, you got me through the pandemic with your amazing music, just saying. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. But Voodoo Ray, like you said, just always so positive and so giving. He was always trying to figure out a way to like, work with me, especially after I got mm -hmm. summer kids. We were trying to figure out something to do together. Yeah. And Fruition, but just yeah, a, just he's a, so yeah. Like, I mean, one of my earliest memories of Ray, like when I met him, he was still, of course, dancing and killing it, but he wasn't going off like the way I heard stories about him from like a really dear friend of mine, uh, Ian uh, Cyclone, who would always talk about oh, seeing Ray in the club battling, and because you know at that point he was that's the thing. He did everything, right? He had these parties he promoted, but he, he like hosted parties and he was always trying to create opportunities for artists. Like yes. he really was a gatekeeper and like a connector in the truest sense of the word. Yes. And he made people feel so comfortable. Like he always. made people feel so good. Yes. So, um, and then I remember once, did you ever go to APT? Yes. Um, on a Wednesday, right? Yes. I remember out of the corner of my eye, just seeing this, this dude just like throwing swipes. Like, you know, in the middle, I, I don't know if you're familiar with this breaking move swipes, it's yeah. right, acrobatic, whatever, one leg up in the air, throwing your arms mm -hmm. and your legs. And I'm like, who's this guy? I'm like, it's Ray in this, like barely any space. Didn't knock anything over, uh, didn't hit anybody. So smooth. And I was like, so oh my gosh, I'm seeing some of that. And then, you know, um, yeah, I mean, such an incredible dancer. Like, just that alone, his yeah. dancing uh, is incredible. And then and all the other things. He's a host, because now that I think about it, he worked a lot with um, uh, Lyricist Lounge, Danny Castro, and those guys. Yeah. And so they did, they used to do a lot of shows at Summer Stage. Yeah. He's a host, typically. And just he is missed. He is absolutely missed. Um, but so now I just want to talk about. So wait, so correct me. Did. Did you perform with Ma Wu when I presented you guys in Queensbridge? <laughs> yes. And not too long ago, long ago we rewatched that footage. Oh. Um, the crew had a really lovely opportunity to work with the State Department and do this um, virtual performance for people in young students in Tajikistan and Kazakhstan, wow. which was kind of amazing. It was it was really about sort of like um, encouraging, yeah, talking about um, you know different just different part of our artists' lives and also linked to like studying abroad and like learning about other cultures. Anyways, it was, um, and we were trying to remember some old choreography because it was like a long show. And we're like, oh shoot. And we rewatched that footage. I was like, ah! <laughs> I'm laughing because that was really probably like my first or second year at Summer Stage. And that's people, that was when the shows used to be in the afternoon in the middle of the freaking day. With this it was hot, it was right? So hot. It was so hot. I was like, oh, shit. <laughs> oh, that was the white Marley floor, right? <laughs> Which is and like a little death. Tent. It's so hard for us with sneakers in the Marley. It's like, <laughs> But yeah, after that season, I demanded that all the shows be put at night because the Central Park shows would be at night. Yeah. But the citywide, the borough shows are in the afternoons, like, Kids out here are suffering in the heat. The <laughs> audience is suffering. No one wants to come because they're burning up. You know what I'm saying? Uh, and that was like a multi-artist show because it was you guys. Um, Adesla had something going on. Yeah. Adesla. I think. Um, and I think it was actually presented in conjunction with, um, oh my God, Aviva Davidson. What oh, yeah. Dancing, dancing in the street, street right? She was yes. doing Dancing in the Street then, yeah. Oh, such another powerhouse. Yeah. Um, and supporter of the arts, especially totally. hip hop and break dance, all of that. Totally. That's actually, I feel like she did something through Dancing in the Streets at Lincoln Center that Stretch and Odessa choreographed. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and that's where I met Gus. Because really? Gus was the like artistic advisor, like outside eye dramaturg kind of. Yeah. Um, and I'll never forget, cause we're like, you know, it was a lot of dancers. They, I mean, it was incredible. They had us like moving throughout the space and it was like, mm -hmm. I'm so happy. I'm so grateful I was a part of that. Shout out to Stretch and Adesla. Oh, yes. The illest. But Gus comes in with his super long legs and his fanny pack. 
And he just, we, we were like ciphering up and he did this little drop to the floor and he came up and I was like, <laughs> come on, fanny packs. And, um, and to this day, Gus and I, um, I'm still connected to Gus and he'll like, you know, he'll like watch some of my work and give me feedback and it's, nice. um, yeah, he's, I adore him. And that's so important, you know, yeah. that generationally, which is why I love this work that you're doing for the Guggenheim. I, I can't wait to see it. So like, I should yeah. be performing together and, and you know, I got to say, listen, yes, I'm in my fifties now. I have my dance career. I love the kids. I mean, it really makes me sad when I hear older dancers like bashing younger artists or just just instead of bashing them, how about reach out to them and say, you know what, can I mentor you or can I just you know talk you through some of your process and maybe we can collaborate, you know, because I think there should be more of that. It could be more. Yeah, I mean, I do want to really shout out that the club is where that happens all the like the intergenerational thing is in the club all the time. So yes. what we're doing in this project is just like reflecting what's happening in the club not to say that it I, I i'm always really big about this like you can never replace the club like the club can't exist anywhere else but the club like right even if we're doing things that we do at the club it's going to be automatically different when we're not in that space because that's yeah. sacred space and it's participatory and it's community and it's about all this whole other stuff but yeah the ideas that like like i wrote i you know bias are so weird because they feel like really reductive but that line that is in my bio is really real. Like the, the fact that the underground scene in New York inspired me and gave me the confidence to be an artist is 100% true because it's at the club where like you feel supported by the community. It's like the co collective consciousness like celebrates the individual. That's happening all the time, every night. Yeah. I mean, before the pandemic, right? And yeah. that intergenerational thing is happening every night too because you're dancing with people that have been out partying for 40 years or 10 years or five oh, years, right? So you know, the reason I even have the relationships I have with the elders is because we've danced together and they yeah. were open enough to do that. And same thing with, with Mau, that's what we're, we're like, as a crew, we've always connected with the, with our elders. It's been essential to us, you know? Um, so I feel like this piece, you know, and I do have to say, you know, you brought up Ray and, I, you know, I can't help but think it's like Ray and Marge and Tyrone, we've lost so many people. Yeah. And it's like, I, I mean, not to be like this, but it's like, I don't want to celebrate people when they're gone. Like, right. we should celebrate each other when we're here. And so this Absolutely. piece is also about that. You know, the cast range, rages in age from 26 to 78. Like, I let's did, I read that. That's awesome. Let's do it. You know, it's like, <laughs> let's oh, do it. okay. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the, the joys, the silver linings that came out of this, this awful pandemic is, you know, I got the opportunity to, you know, take my entire summer season online virtually. Mm. And one of the projects that I did for National Dance Day was this piece that I, you know, for the love of dance. And then the final film was Love Letter to New York. And it was presented with the help of 404 Presents, uh, these two mm -hmm. wonderful women that are, you know, started their company during the pandemic, film, dance, and musicians together. And so we put together um, 12 just like dancers from different genres um, to beautiful music by two band members of Lake Street Dive. And one of the dancers was Gus Solomon. Like it was really important to me to have someone of that generation um, in the piece. I've met him here and there. He doesn't know me, I don't know, but I of course know who he is. But it's, he starts to film talking from his loft and he's, he's sitting in his chair the whole time. And all he's doing is his, his quarter bras. Okay, it steals the whole thing. I know. <laughs> I mean, that's how I feel. Like, no, Gus is like that. One of the last shows I saw, or I don't remember exactly. Now everything's a blur time-wise, but I saw him perform at Joe's Pub and he did this amazing. He has these puppets. He has like a little Gus puppet and he like oh. performs with it. And then he also has like a Martha Graham puppet and a oh. Morse Cunningham puppet. Like, he's brilliant. I mean, it's he's brilliant. a dancer and an actor and a creator and a scholar. Like, he has so much to offer it's mm -hmm. like this idea that we have in this country that as you get older somehow you like expire like no it's the opposite all the elders around me are the people that inspire me so much yeah. like seriously michelle saunders the first day of our residency i was playing her this oh no after rehearsal i was like oh, i've got some new headphones i was hype about them i finally got wireless headphones hello i'm late but okay and i i had her listen to a song and she was giving me footwork like i mean I was like, Michelle, you never, what? Like, really, like, fast feet, 78, just feeling yeah. it. 
And like, you know how songs are like 10 minutes long? The whole <laughs> song. It's not like she does a little cute two step for a second. Oh my God, this is crazy because I was just about to say, that's why I miss Sunday Sermon. And here comes DJ Storm and Norman joining the room. Oh my God, I miss it too. Oh, Sunday Sermon, come the on. Sunday best. Sermon. It's like one of the only parties I can walk to because I'm up on 145th <laughs> Street. I loved it. I was like, I'm not taking my Metro card. I'm not taking my phone. It's like, it's the that's best. That's so true. That's so true. So I, would, I do want to ask you, though, um, when did you start your company? So uh, officially, 2012. And I say officially only because it actually wasn't official in the moment. But I realized afterwards, like, oh, I guess that's how, when we started. Because um, it was the first evening length work I made. Mm -hmm. And it was at Dixon Place. And basically, um, I had performed. Oh, it kind of went like this. I'll try to make, I'll try to make this short. But... I thought I got my dream job dancing in a show in Europe and I like packed up my apartment and I went and I got injured. I got a tear in my meniscus, but it was like bad and I couldn't squat down. And obviously with all breaking floor work, it's like, oh, I got yeah. to squat. Um, and I came home to get surgery and then I was recovering, which again, I know it's not like such a huge surgery. I know that people out there have gotten ACLs or, you know what I'm saying? I know that that's way bigger. So. I don't want to exaggerate, but for me, it was my first real injury that I was like, oh, what, mm -hmm. you know? And then I started taking an acting class because I didn't want to get the blues. And then I started writing and I was like, mm -hmm. oh, I wrote something about, um, we had to do these monologues and I wrote something about growing up with four brothers. So I have four big brothers and just kind of the frustration as a kid of like not being able to be them. I just wanted to be them. Like they could have been giraffes. I would have wanted to be a giraffe, right? Like I just looked up to them so much. And then, of course, I realized after I wrote it, like, oh, no, this is a piece. Like, this is a dance. I have to dance this whenever I get back. And it was the first thing I did after my knee surgery. And it, I did it at Dixon Place as part of the Hot Festival. And then they, I guess someone, like, last minute dropped out of a curated evening. They were supposed mm -hmm. to curate an evening. And then they were like, hey, do you want to curate something? And I was like, oh, my gosh, yes, I do. What? And I, it was amazing. I got to, yeah. So Mal performed and Afro, oh, uh, wait, now I'm, like, forgetting. Oh, no, like, it was, like, a big, Afro Mosaic Soul performed, I believe. <laughs> um it was so long ago, but basically it was, yeah, Afro Mosaic Soul, Mau, and then I had a friend of mine who's a contemporary dancer who had lived in, like, um, Amsterdam. Like, it was a total, like, let's just all be together and, like, do this. And then, um, and then they called me after that and were like, hey, do you want to do an, something evening length? And I was like, what? what? What do you mean? I had a choreograph something that was longer than 11 minutes. I didn't know. <laughs> So, but I was like, okay, yeah. And so then for me, that was like a 45 minute piece. And I guess that was the beginning, you know? That's awesome. Uh, yeah, so that's sort of the way, I mean, short version of it, but. And yeah, I have been like- nominated for that, right? For a Bessie. Oh, yeah, that was, yeah, yes, a single ride. I mean, come on. So, so thank you. <laughs> you. You hurt your knee, you come home, you stay engaged, you stay inspired. And then boom, that's what happens. That's, that's me is just, I, mean, I think about even myself, like with my injury from Ailey, and for me, it was writing music. I started writing music and songs. And they were all dark and in minor keys because I was sad. But <laughs> well, I should say the first solo I ever choreographed for myself was, and, and it kind of like changed the way I thought about movement. I mean, of course, the club changed the way I thought about movement. It gave me all this understanding of movement as a place of freedom, right? Yes. Um, but it was Nina Simone Namakitpa, her version of that. Because it just ripped me to shreds every time I heard it. Oh. Anyway, so, yes. So, I'm with you. Okay, go ahead. So, you were writing music. Danny, sorry. No, I'm just saying, like, you know, you took this thing that happened to you. And then out of this pain came your company, really. I mean, which I, th I think is glorious. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, it was, like, a long process. I kind of, like, truncated it for you. No, but, but yes, still, in a way that it. is. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, isn't that the way, uh, isn't that the way, you know? The hindsight, like, I was so angry, you know, of course, when I had to leave dancing, but the things that developed over the next few years after that made me realize, okay, yeah, this is exactly where I needed to be. Even yeah. now, like, yeah, I'm right where I want to be or need to be or supposed to be universe. And I'm so glad you mentioned that about, you know, in this country, the whole ageism thing that this, <laughs> I am so not about that. I'm like, okay. I feel my sexiest right now. By you the look so fly. 
<laughs> well, I was on a call earlier, so the cat's out of the bag. I posted it earlier this week. I was invited by uh, Ayazali Cassell and Toria Beard to perform at Little Island in September. Amazing. And the thread of the evening is just about that, how we're, you know, we're older, mature, seasoned individuals, but we still have something to offer as artists, as human beings, as sexual beings, like all of the above. Like, we, we're not done that. Come on. No way. There's so much. I mean, like, I'm, I'm not exaggerating when I tell you at that first um, residency we did, we did at Katzban, the bubble residency, Archie, oh. he, he was the most full out. Here we are, the rest of us. Okay, let's mark this run. Let's, you know, we don't have to do, we'll do this part full out, but this is, Archie is like, leg kick split. I'm like, we got to up our game. I mean, what are we doing over here? <laughs> right, because that's the generation, like my generation, we were no holds barred. Mm -hmm. We were balls to the wall. Yeah. And we rehearsal. And that's why when I hear these stories about, you know, from different company directors or rehearsal directors, like, oh, these kids are lazy. They don't want to do this or that. I'm talking about under us generation. And I'm just like, I don't understand what that is. I mean, we were full out. Yeah. I mean, we had to be told to mark. Yeah. <laughs> you can mark this now. But we knew yeah. going in that full out every time. Yeah, yeah. No, I know. And it's something about also, I mean, well, interesting in relationship to the pandemic specifically, it was coming out of that being like, can I still do this? I need to right. check. Right. <laughs> like, is this muscle memory here? Can I still do this? Can I hold, hold this freeze? Can I do, do I still remember the spot on my back to do this thing? Um, it was actually interesting when we did, we filmed Odeon at the Joyce um, just in I'm April. And we were rehearsing in masks. And we did that whole show rehearsing in masks. And when we went into the rehearsal process, I was like, this is basically altitude training. Like, we're going to be, it's like, we're in Colorado in the mountains, and we're running the show, an hour long show, which is not like step touch, even though I love a good step touch. It's okay. like, so it's like, that was beautiful, by the way, I did get to see that. That was awesome. So that, um, that's Thank so perfect, because it takes me to my next question, which is working with your brother. I looked at your photos on Facebook, and of course, Instagram, just to like get a sense of you. Mm -hmm. You yeah. seem so close to your family and your mom. Oh, my mom is the Aww. best. No, I mean, I'm so blessed. They're like, yeah, my mom, she is turning 76 mm -hmm. on Saturday. Um, on Saturday, yeah. Saturday is the 29th, right? She's still, she mom. is like, she still takes ballet. Like, she did it online. She's this through this pandemic. She's like, I took a Pilates class. I took a Pilates class with my mom online once. <laughs> I tried to, she was like, try this Pilates class. I was like, mom. I cannot do like she they are doing the hundreds or whatever and I was like come on like, mom yeah she's amazing she's beautiful the pictures of you two together and just like mm. just her birthday photos oh just awesome so wait so tomorrow's her birthday uh, oh my god yeah see it's when I get in these bubble residencies I don't know what day it is but yeah so well, happy Friday, birthday right? to her so, so yes I will tell her thanks Danny. Yeah. <laughs> and tell me about working with your brother so this um so Odeon was your second time working with your brother right yes. yeah that like I mean do you guys fight do you guys dance? yes I will tell you um so the first time we worked together was for the river to river festival and that was but it was also kind of the culmination of my work at uh University of uh, Wisconsin Milwaukee when I was looking at the vernacular jazz dance roots of breaking hip hop and house and just kind of knowing that my brother's a jazz pianist, like mm -hmm. prolific, incredible jazz pianist. So like hip hop was in my ear growing up, but also my brother playing jazz, right, at home. And I wasn't making those connections, right? Mm -hmm. And I have to really shout out Marge, rest in peace, um, for like in her embodied way and of course in speaking with her, like showing me so clearly the way the continuum of African-American vernacular dance exists right from tap dancing and vernacular jazz right and lindy and i mean before that i guess swing and blues and rock and roll and funk right and hip-hop and house and all that stuff to understand and and of course rooted in west african movement and rhythm right like all this thing and i'm like oh shoot like she would be you know she would be doing house footwork and doing like different iterations of what various west african arms in the middle of the footwork or she'd do she'd throw in like a charleston step in the middle of the footwork and so i was yeah. like ah shoot and also big shout out to montel Jordan. same thing that his work is so rooted in that and he was so generous with sharing with so many of us his research in that and so mm -hmm. um when i decided to go to grad school which definitely was because i thought like I, 
you know, I didn't know. I didn't know what was going on. It was things were really kind of a, a down moment, right? Like mm -hmm. I was trying to create, I was, wasn't popping off. Everything was like, oh, I was like, mm -hmm. I, should, I should go to school. Like I need to, yeah. you know, like, and then, um, and so I, I knew I wanted to focus on that. And so I really researched a lot of, uh, about the spirit moves, that documentary, um, which really chronicles African-American vernacular dance from like, early 20th century yeah. through like 83. Talk about some footage of Rennie you haven't seen. Have you seen the footage of Rennie in that? It's oh. amazing. Oh my God. You have to text me that name again afterwards. Yes, I think oh I like gosh. maybe even like texted him a video cause I saw it like at the public library. Like I was at the public library watching it in the archive, you know? Yes. Anyway, so um, all of that to say that felt like the moment uh, or I was really inspired to be like, oh, this is my dance family and this is my blood family. Like, let's do something together, right? Because the yes. interests were like doing this. And so we did it at, um, oh, yeah, I think the clip that you showed from Spain, we were dancing to Manteca, right? Dizzy Gillespie. Yes. Gillespie. Um, that's part of this piece, Riff This, Riff That. That was right. the first collaboration with my brother. Piece. Thanks. And, um, and we were surprised, I have to say, that we did not kill each other. <laughs> We're only a year and a half apart, and we oh, thought wow. so much growing up. But I think we realized ultimately that we are actually very similar, and we're both artists, awesome. and we both kind of went this way that's non-traditional and, like, trying to figure it out. Um, and so then he introduced me to the music of Ernesto Nazareth, who is the composer for Odeon, mm -hmm. a very niche Brazilian music. Again, super old. It's, like, 18, composed from, like, 1893 to 1934. But oh, it's wonderful. Yeah, I would hear him play to the gigs, and I'd be like, oh, you play a little samba in the middle of the gig. Yes. And then he'd be like, oh, it's Nazareth. And so slowly, slowly from there, you know, we decided to work together again, and it worked out. No, I mean, the, the musicality of, of that work in particular is just it's, it's so sparkling and, and just brilliant. I just love it. Um, it's really fun to dance. It was a real gift to be able to do that together again after so long, yeah, you know? Yeah, after the video that I posted, um, so Omari's in that video. What do you think about Omari? Oh, legendary. How I mean, he Omari. is legendary. Come on. It was just like, he is everything. I just, I mean, he is such an incredible human and artist. I cannot like heap praises on him enough. I'm so happy for him. He's so excited glorious. For it's amazing. The, um, the, the Fira, am I saying it right? Turanga, Tobago? Oh yeah. Fira, yeah. Right. I, I believe um, my Monique. 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 You're here. First of all, Monique, are you still here? I want to shout out Monique right quick. Yeah, are Monique, you here? Monique is everything. What? I need to tell the story about Monique. Please Monique do. is the first person. But let, me, let, me, let me do it like this. She called me and she said, hey, I'm Monique. You know, um, I've been following your career. And I'm like, a career? What? I have a career? This is like, I'm like, no one's ever said I had a career. Like, what, oh. what does that mean? Like, she, I don't know what that even means, but I'm going to listen. Like, <laughs> and then she wanted to talk to me about Fira Taraga. That's how we got over there. She That's totally awesome. hooked that up. So I just want to say, Monique, thank you so much. You know, I love you so much. And I will never forget that conversation. It changed me. I was like, oh, wait, maybe I'm actually doing this. Like, she, if Monique thinks I have a career, like, does that mean I have a career? Like, yes. <laughs> well, if she's not on here, this will archive, and I'll make oh, sure she's... Okay, yeah, on. please, please. No, Monique is my girl, and I met Monique um, in 2000, I want to say seven, early 2008, when she came to Summer Stage, and mm. we've been, we've been just girls, the girls ever since. I mean, you know, you know, you have those people in your life that you know you can, like my girl Michi right there, that's also there. Um, that you know, you can call whenever and with the good news or not so good news, and mm -hmm. they give you straight. And so I just yeah, shout out to Monique. Martin. Yeah, shout out to Monique. So do you have about like five or five or ten more minutes? I have a couple more questions. Sure, sure. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me look. Let me. Let me. We started at nine today for you specifically because oh, we do ten to six God. usually. But I was like, we have to start at nine because I have to chat with you. <laughs> Thank you so much for that adjustment. Um, of course, of course. So I won't, I won't hold you too much longer. No, no, it's fine. It's I like yeah. to chat with you. It's so we great. talked about underscore, which again, guys, thank you for watching. I'm talking to Effort Ashery. Am I saying your name properly, Ashery? Yeah, um, Asheri is the last name. Asheri, oh yeah, my God. It's okay. okay. Asheri sounds kind of French and lovely. It's what that's, yeah. <laughs> Asheri, Effort Asheri. Okay, yeah. thank you for that. No, that's cool. It's good. So her company will be performing at the Guggenheim on June 2nd. Am I getting that right? Yeah. 6.30 and 8.30. And yep. the tickets that will go on sale 72 hours before. I will post a link to the show as well as 
at Fred's uh, website in my bio after this, so you'll get all the information. And please follow her and her company. I mean, they're doing such amazing work. Thank you. Um, I did go back and look at, you know, some former interviews that you did, and I'm really curious, too. Mm -hmm. I mean, with this, you know, racially charged year that we've just had and that we're still in, and you did, you know, you spoke to Dia Corliss. I, I, I went back to that interview, and you talked about, you know, being a white woman in this culture, and, and you know, that you said you recognize your privilege and that you have a responsibility. And with so much happening over this past year and a half, ha has that changed? Has it, has it, you know, gotten even more crucial to you? I mean, how, how is your feeling about it now? Um, I mean, it's always been crucial. Yeah. I think, I think it's about, you know, so the club, in a way, is this like magnifying glass or magnifying lens um, for like how unjust a, like the above ground world is, right? Because you go into the underground and it's like inclusive, tolerant, peace and love, feel, you know, houses of some freedom dancing, Ejo says, right? And it's like, it, it's coming from like the experience of the African Amer African American community, and LGBTQ plus community, right? And it's like, it's coming out of like resilience and joy and pain and yet everybody is welcome. And it's like, that is insane when you think yeah. about that concept, right? Like, fuck. And that, you know, that sort of utopia in the best sense of the word is not what exists above ground. Right. Right? It is not what exists for people of color above ground in any way, right? So right. if you're white and you're in that community, that is the thing that's like, oh, right. I cannot even pretend like I don't see this. Like, get it together, right? right. So, um, so that's always been a part of everything, right? It's not, um, but I, like, that understanding, I think, because, um, I don't know, sometimes I think about, like, how the way I was raised has really shaped me. So because we moved from, I mean, granted, I didn't really live in Israel, but still that my parents are, you know, Israeli and, like, culturally and all that stuff in certain ways, Although things that's let's not start talking about that because then we'll really start forget it because the, the I'm not for seven you. hours. But uh, um, but just the sort of having a lot of friends from like all over the world growing up, right? And that that you always sort of like lean in and like listen to understand someone else's culture, and you ask questions, uh, and you're reverent, and you're polite, and you you know what I'm saying? Like you respect. So I was really lucky that that's how I was raised. So of course, if I'm going into a space that's not my culture that I'm born into, you better yes. know I'm going to be like respectful and try to understand what's going on. And I was so lucky because I did have people from the beginning who showed me like the cultural, I keep using this, but cultural reflective nature of the st of all the forms. So like with break easy, it wasn't just like, oh, here, learn like a six step. It was like, oh, okay, a bunch of you come over to the house. I'm going to play you these records. You're going to see the newspaper clippings. Of yeah. when we're back. This is what was going on in New York at the time. This is what was going on in Brooklyn versus the Bronx in the seventies. Right? Like I was lucky because I got to come into it in that yes. way, which yes. changed everything for me. Yes. Giving like having the sociopolitical context, taught to me along with the movement like mm -hmm. and the cultural understanding right here right and then just being in the club for so many years so mm -hmm. there's no way that like you can separate the dance from the culture and it is a sort of a paradox of like yeah that's why I always say like once you put the dance on stage it's not it's different like yeah. it's never I never want people to be passive and be like oh yeah so I, it was like I went to that show and it was like I was at the club no you were not at the club Go to the club if you want to go to the club. Right. You saw a dance performance with artists that are rooted in these forms, that are mm -hmm. part of this community, that are moved by this, that have mm -hmm. their intersections with the forms, and they've come together to create something that hopefully inspires you. Yeah. But ask questions about what you saw. You know what I mean? Like, so um, again, because it is really like sacred movement, right? Mm -hmm. and, and stories and histories that are still alive. And obviously, you know, like with everything, sort of the, everything that, has been going on obviously for 400 years in this country in terms of systemic racism, but kind of came to the foreground in the last year in terms of all the like mass mobilizations of people fighting to end racial injustice. You know what I mean? So it's like, there's so much to be said. Okay. So all of this to answer your question is like, it's always on my mind. This yes. past year, I think the tangible question that I asked myself was like, 
is art making enough? Like, why, mm. why did it take me this long to be phone banking? You know what I mean? Like, what is up with mm. my actual, like, tangible political action that's yeah. outside of the art world? Like, yes. can I find a way in in that? Um, because, yes, as a, as, like, a choreographer, as an artist, as a dancer, and, you know, when you're in the position to talk to presenters who are maybe, you know, not hip to, like, what's really going on and how to, like, shift the lens and make right. changes so organizations are more equitable. Of course, you take, you know, I take those opportunities. If I'm in a position to put people on, right, like, always. But that that's always been the case because that is what I learned from the community. Exactly. Right? Put people on. March, put people on. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's what you do when you're part of a community. And so, like, yes. and again, I, I don't know. So, yes, yes. The answer is yes. I'm thinking about it all the time, and I'm thinking about how to, yeah, how to stay in it and yeah. make change where I can make change and I and recognizing the yeah the privilege and the opportunities that I have just being white in this country yeah. um and what I yeah and and I'm so thankful for for your words on that I really do respect that and I appreciate that so much I mean obviously being a presenter I have a platform and the ability to put people on and I have to be very thoughtful about that because you know you're putting I, it, it freaked me out at first because in the, the moment that I realized I'm creating an evening for people to come see and watch and feel something, that was a huge responsibility. Mm. It freaked me out. I got to tell you, um, it just still freaks me out. <laughs> but, yeah, know. but that's why we do it. Like, it's still, every time I present a work, it's not like I'm like, oh, I got this. No, I'm like, oh my God. No, is this going to be the worst thing ever? Or is it going to be, yes. Yeah, I mean, you want people to walk away feeling yeah. something, whether it's joy, anger, whatever it is. Yeah. Um, but it is a privilege, even me as a Black woman, but being in the position that I'm in with, you know, presenting and uh, it, it is a privilege to be, just to be in the arts and have yeah. a platform to speak from so you can maybe affect some change and just like you said we we do what we can but we have to stay engaged i mean there's no turning back now oh. it's how yeah there yeah. really is no turning back now but uh, so when do you when do you leave the bubble so we kind of have that crazy day um we leave on the second and i wanted to say this earlier we actually go so i'm gonna just tell you the real tea we go the second in the morning we get tested at 7 a.m and then we're actually going we're leaving at 7 30 and we're going to harlem stages where we're filming um something for harlem stages e-move virtual presentation oh, wow. am i supposed to even say that yet i'm not sure but anyways i think it's fine <laughs> i hope so <laughs> but we're doing a little excerpt of underscored for that and then we're going over to the guggenheim to like space and that and then we're going to do two shows so That's a long two second is going to be crazy marathon but hey we have to take advantage of the fact that we're safe and it's a bubble and we can do it you know yes so, what a day yeah oh my goodness I know. <laughs> so, they have y'all and so the end of that show you're not stepping off you're not somewhere getting covid to at the hot dog stand <laughs> <laughs> got you. So, so i know it's like <laughs> <laughs> well, what what else do you want us to know about the show? What oh, else coming well, up with the company besides emos? Um, okay. Oh yeah, I will shout out one other project that this was the biggest learning experience I had thus far, which was oh my gosh, Nico! I want you to see this little Arctic <laughs> fox. Nico, is I everything reversed you. here? I can't tell. Do you see there me? There he Nico? is. Yes. Hey, Nico, come with me. So cute. Love. Oh, no, the He's camera shy. No, <laughs> the best though. Um, okay, so I, I, this exciting uh, project that was initially supposed to be for the, you know, the stage turned into a film, like a twenty-five minute film mm -hmm. for geared towards young audience audiences. And it's a co-commission with the Kennedy Center. And it is a collaboration with this illustrator who I adore. And he's incredible, Mo Willems. He was the inspiration for the work. And it's coming out June 7th. And it's going to be streamed. Um, if you are a teacher, a school teacher of young children, you can just watch it for free. You should just send me an email. <laughs> and I'll give you a code. And kids can see it for free. And it's kind of this wild dance film with animation so oh, i'm hey. excited about it and it's i learned so much doing it wow the film world is like <laughs> and anyways so that's yeah, the information i'll definitely link it to this 
Great. And awesome. Tell me the name of the illustrator again. Um, Mo Willems. Mo Willems. Yeah. Okay. And the piece is called In the Moment. Oh, that's moment. So funny. Okay. <laughs> I'm always. I always love a good pun. <laughs> yeah. Well, good for you. I mean, the people Thanks. on here are saying that they are going to come to the show. They can't wait to see it. Cool. I'm hoping that we can like hug or say hi. So I know. Just but also, we're neighbors because you're in Washington Heights, right? I am. And I'm at, up, up in Harlem. I'm up in Harlem, so we're close. So I'm at 173rd. Oh, oh you 173rd. Okay. I'm 145th. Okay, close enough. See, now everybody knows where I live, but it's cool. Okay. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> We'll be looking for you. <laughs> this has been so wonderful getting to know you this way. Likewise. And, I mean, I haven't had the pleasure of directly, you know, presenting you yet. Um, but this is wonderful. I, I think you're such an inspiration. I mean, I love watching you perform. I love the way you bring folks together. And I absolutely cannot wait to see this intergenerational performance on Tuesday. That's, I mean, how fun. Thank you. And I will say, well, first I want to say, I changed the angle and this looks crazy, but okay. <laughs> Um, this has been so, I like weirdly feel like I know you kind of because I don't know, IG or I don't know, just our intersection. So it's been really lovely to actually get to chat. I do want to say that oh, this is sliding that, um, we, because of the acoustics of the rotunda, there's actually a lot of speaking in the work that I had to pull, take out of the work because, um, like there's actually storytelling, like legitimate storytelling. Mm -hmm. Um, that I think particularly you, Danny, because of your history with Paradise Garage, you would lose your mind. But because of, we want people to like, really be able to, you know, fully experience the thing. We, I have to take it out because you can't hear it. So just yeah. know that in this iteration, there isn't, it. we are telling stories with our bodies. <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm sure it'll be just as fabulous. And do you yeah, think- excited. Um, will it come to the stage, you know, later on in the year? Yes, that is the hope. Like the full evening thing to me is like an hour. It has projections, you know what I mean? It has lighting, like yeah. you're gonna see, I mean, I'm so excited about, okay, so I'm gonna, now I can't stop talking shit. Okay, <laughs> Love I'll just it. say this one thing. The very first evening that I went, uh, first evening length uh, show that I made, the single ride, the one at Dixon Place, I was a really hype about this idea of seeing floor work from a bird's eye view. Like it was just mm -hmm. something that I loved and I was so inspired by breaking floor work, obviously, but also the the hustle, right? New York hustle, it's called New York hustle. I had a long conversation with Abdiel. Shout out to Abdiel. Oh, I love that video. Uh, that I yeah, love him. we talked about sort of the uh, parallel history with hustle and breaking, how it was like, uh, coming out of the African-American and Latinx community together. So, um, cause a lot of people will say Latin hustle, but it's like both the communities. Anyways, just shouting that out. But um, I was really into hustle too, because I was learning that at the club, you know? And so I love the idea of taking hustle turn patterns and putting them on the floor with other breaking threads. And so mm -hmm. that's one of the first things I started exploring when I first started choreographing and like feel like I'm still continuing. Anyways, in that first show, I like had <laughs> actually the director of photography for the film that I just made. He like, I was like, David, we have to get this film from above. And I remember we got free rehearsal space at the Joffrey. He got mm. on a scaffolding and is like filming the thing. Yes! And then we projected it on the back of uh, Dixon Place. And then yes! the dancing happened here so the audience could see it on the floor. Anyways, the point is at the Guggenheim, I get to live my bird's eye view dreams. <laughs> See? And it's everybody can see together. the work. I'm so happy. <laughs> Your master plan. That was a long story. I'm, so, no, oh, I'm sorry. No, it's great. No, hearing these, it just gives me jazz, creativity. It's just, I love it. That's why I'm loving these conversations. It just keeps me lifted mm. and so inspired. I'm so happy for you, and I can't wait to see the work. Thank you. And I will, I, are you? Let me know what show you're going to come to so I'll look for you and I can give you a hug. Okay, I will. Um, but thank you for doing this. Thanks for taking the time. Thanks for adjusting your rehearsal No, today. my pleasure. My pleasure. And oh, happy birthday to your mom. Oh. <laughs> I will tell her. I'll send her this. Yes. <laughs> oh, thank you, Ian. Ian. I'm hugging you, Ian. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, I mean, I guess have a great weekend. The weather's a little iffy, but mm. continue on with your rehearsals and whatnot. And thank you so much, Danny. That's going to be a long day on Wednesday. What? We're looking forward to it. We're looking forward and to it. And don't be afraid to, like, hoot and holler at the Google oh. time. Like, we want all of that. You I got know? you covered, girl. I'm a silly girl. I got you covered. Okay, good. <laughs> You'll hear me. 
Well, thank um, you so much for this. Good luck with everything. And I can't wait to see you back in the city. Oh, there she is. Monique, we just said your name. We spoke Monique. about- Monique. I don't know if you heard what Efra said before, but you'll see it on video. We spoke We spoke to about you, Monique. We gave you so much love. Yes, so much love. Oh, yes. Oh, Ian, yeah, the Linda's beautiful wedding. Oh. <laughs> but Ian, you kept me going this pandemic. Oh. Thank you so much. So much. Oh, best. So, I'm going to let you out. And I'm going to say goodbye. And I will see you on Wednesday. Yes, can't wait. Thanks, Danny. Thank you, everyone, for Thank tuning you. in. Bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> awesome sauce. Oh, my God. How wonderful is she? OK. <laughs> And again, happy birthday to her beautiful mother. I can't wait to see her show on Wednesday. And so thank you all for watching. Again, Efrat's company will be performing Wednesday at the Guggenheim, June 2nd. That's Wednesday, yes. Um, do the 6.30 show and an 8.30 show. And uh, the tickets go on sale on the Guggenheim website. It's the Works and Process Series. Um, the, but the tickets open up 72 hours before, so they're not always silly quite yet. Um, but Efra is amazing, and her company is amazing, and so she's doing this hot intergenerational thing that's happening with you know club heads from back in the day. Come on, so come through, and thank you for watching. Next week, uh, legendary Rennie Harris has agreed to come on the hip hop head. My Philly brother, I cannot wait. <laughs> That's going to be something else. So thank you for watching, as always. I love New York. New York is coming back. We're doing it. We're getting out in these streets. I'm about to get out in the streets myself. Stay safe, though. We're still in it. We don't want this to come back. We don't want this to come back. But uh, anyway, I love you guys. Oh, and keep your eye out because the summer stage season is going to be announced on June 3rd. So keep your eyes out for that and see all the things that we're doing this summer and we'll be back. So see you next week and have a great, great, safe weekend. Thank you. Bye.